overly dramatic music and a bag full of watch bits. What more could you actually want? Now this watch came to me as is. I've got a feeling the seller knew a little bit more about this than he actually let on. It's a complete trash nugget. As you can see, it will need a full restoration. It comes with a free dirt, as these things often do. So in this video, we're going to take a look at completely disassembling the movement of this thing, getting it back in working order. With a bit of luck, we'll have to electroplate the case. Uh, just, it's just not wearable as is and we'll need to clean up and finish the dial a little bit as well as change the loom on the hands i'm even going to bang in a bit of strap making in this video because a nice watch or this watch deserves a very nice handmade strap now you might be wondering why i have a fictional english spy on an american flag with a watch in the thumbnail that clearly says swiss made and i'm going to bring you through that whole journey of why <laughs> that's all on there but i also wanted to let you know that i did acquire a microscope for this video a link micro one it's a great addition to the toolkit and it will allow me to show you in even more detail exactly what is wrong with this watch but before we can get into that we need to continue the disassembly now as you can see this watch is pretty beat up it's got a lot of dirt and grime and oil on it it's just it doesn't tick at all it's quite heavily wound at the moment so i'm going to start by removing the balance complete here and the balance cock just so I don't make a mistake, slip and bend that extremely delicate hairspring. So I'm going to continue the disassembly of this watch in the background while I cover some of the history of Gruen. But before that, I'd like to point out a mistake I made here. Genuine senior moment. So some of you have mentioned you've been following along with me, which is great. Uh, this screwdriver is too small. You can put that down to senile dementia if you like, but don't do this. It'd be very easy to slip and damage your screws and nobody likes a damaged screw. So the history of Gruen starts with Dietrich Gruen, the man who is the namesake of the company. Now he immigrated to the USA after training in Switzerland. So he worked for various Swiss watch companies to learn his trade and eventually would move to Ohio to work for a watchmaker there. Now in 1874, Gruen came up with an improved safety pinion that he actually got a patent for. And I think this was basically his kick up the backside moment where he decided to found his own watch company Company, the Gruen Watch Company, which was founded in the USA in the same year. So that covers how Druen got its status as an American watchmaker. They were based in the USA. Dietrich Gruen lived in the USA, as I say, he emigrated there in the mid 1800s. Now, it doesn't explain, though, how I have a picture of James Bond on the thumbnail, and this one's kind of simple. This movement is a Gruen Precision Caliber 510, which was the first watch worn in a Bond movie, or at least rumoured to be. I'm sure someone's done a frame-by-frame -frame analysis. There's some James Bond nutters out there, but it's typically held to be the first watch worn in a Bond movie, played by Sean Connery in the 1962 film Doctor No. It was subsequently seen in From Russia With Love, Goldfinger, You Only Live Twice, and Diamonds Are Forever. Now, the funny thing about that is this watch was rumoured to be Sean Connery's private watch. It wasn't a sponsor deal it wasn't like the Omega uh, thing that now goes on with Bond it was just a watch that Sean Connery bought because he liked it and I can see why this is a lovely lovely watch now one of the funny things is this watch was sold in a variety of different configurations the most obvious being a small second which is the second hand at the six o'clock position in a small sub dial and the center second now the center second would have been the more complicated watch and probably the more expensive one. So do we have here the watch that was too expensive for James Bond? Probably not, but it's an amusing thought nonetheless. Now, no real surprises in this watch so far. Barrel bridge is now coming out after being disassembled. The train of wheels bridge came out and it was extremely wobbly. That's genuinely not something you normally want to see on a watch. Uh, but no real surprises. Now, I like to flip the bridges over when I take them out just to make sure there's nothing stuck underneath, been bitten by that one before. And I'm going to remove the winding and sliding pinions here. You can do this on the other side also when you disassemble the keyless and motion works. Barrel complete comes out, which is where the mainspring lives. For those of you who are not aware, that was what provides the power to the watch. 
Palette Fork and Palette Bridge come out. Now this is jammed together, uh, not uncommon to see. They used to oil the palettes of these old watches, I believe, or at least some companies did. There's some debate as to whether you should oil the palettes on vintage watches. I kind of discussed it with a lot of people in my last video, and I think that truism holds true, that if you ask five watchmakers how to oil a watch, you'll get eight different answers. But anyhow, it's modern horology now not to oil those pivots so I don't generally do it. Now, escape wheel comes out, so I'll need to leave uh, the bridge holding the center wheel in out, and I don't want to damage the escape wheel while we do it. Now, the center wheel here itself is held on the other side via the cannon pinion, so you won't be able to pull that out just yet, and the set lever screw comes out. We're on the other side. I've got the world's cheapest chinesium cannon pinion puller here, but it does the job. Now somebody asked me why I don't just pull off the cannon pinion when I'm removing the hour wheel at the start of the disassembly. And the reason is if you're working on a centre second watch, that centre seconds wheel will have a long pivot on it that the second hand directly connects through that comes up through the centre of the cannon pinion. If you put a cannon pinion on that remover on that while it's still in there, you'll end up breaking the thing and then there'll be a lot of tears before bedtime because there'll be nowhere for your centre second hand to go and you will have converted your three-handed watch into a two-handed watch which is probably i'm gonna guess not what you wanted to do so the disassembly of the keyless and motion works here i'm just checking this intermediate winding wheel isn't actually indexed meaning it's uh, tapered it's not on this watch so it doesn't really matter which way up it goes in when i come to reassemble it now no surprises here with the keyless works so called for those of you that don't know because back in the day pocket watches would require a key to wind and set maybe even two keys and the keyless works allow you to do that with the crown and winding stem meaning you don't have to stick a watch key in your wallet which is extremely convenient now this is a very very easy movement to disassemble if you were thinking about having a go at a watch and you don't mind spending money because these things are not that cheap uh, you might want to pick up one of these it's great uh, thoroughly recommend it now the two jewels the cap jewel and the ink block jewel here will be left on for cleaning and the movement will now go into a ultrasonic cleaner with cleaning fluids i'll link in the description below now here is a fine example of how not to do this the rodico on the end of my stick should not be in contact with the barrel arbor uh, because when i pull the lid off well yeah that happened. So I'm just going to sit here for a moment and contemplate my life choices before I crawl around on the floor, much to the amusement of my cats, and try and find loads of tiny bits. Now, luckily enough, I managed to find it all. I did notice, however, that this spring is not correct for this watch. It's not tall enough. So somebody's had a go at this in the past and tried to get it running, and I think probably failed so that spring will have to be replaced now this watch is staying in my private collection i know i've done a couple of auctions in the past for watches i've repaired or restored on screen but not in this case unfortunately chaps i am keeping this one i genuinely really love this watch so i guess we have to address the elephant in the room a little bit which is how an American watchmaker with an American watch company ends up with Swiss written on the front of the dial. And this is because although Gruen watches were timed in the United States, they were finished in the United States, they were cased in the US, they were actually manufactured in Switzerland. Now, this was at Gruen facilities in Switzerland. This is not a case of a watch manufacturer buying like an ETA and ETA movement and then stamping their name on. These were actually Gruen movements produced by Gruen companies in Switzerland. Switzerland. Gruen actually opened its Gruen Precision Factory in Vienne in Switzerland in 1922. So they've been at this for a long time. Now, for me, they're still an American company because their founder was American, their company was American. They simply opened factories in Switzerland, which was a pretty smart move at the time. So if you do have a watch that says Gruen Precision on the front, you can probably trace its lineage back to that Gruen Precision factory in Switzerland, hence the name Precision on the front. Now this case is trashed. It's useless. You couldn't wear it. There's a 
plating flaking off it looks awful so i'm going to in the background here sand it down now you can use chemical removers to remove the nickel i've never had a lot of luck with this i've had a much better go at sanding the case so i'm going to show you this at various time points this takes a few hours it's very tedious and you're going to have to really like the watch to do this now, the reason I'm showing this on camera is because there's so much fake restoration on YouTube. I think most of it's fake. You know, I'm sure you've seen the one some guy finds a Patek Philippe in a hedgerow and then runs it under a tap and it's like, da-da. Uh, yeah, I've never personally come across a Patek in the hedgerow and I can't see why there would be a seriously expensive watch in a trash heap. I mean, you're walking around with your Rolex Submariner and it falls off your wrist and you're so rich, you're just like, ah, I'll just get another one. Uh, well, yeah, good luck with that, though. So I'm going to show this in here, even though it's a little boring, and then I'll show you it at various different time frames. So this is after about 20 minutes. You can start to see that plating come off. And I'll go through at various different time periods, and then we'll get into a polish. But I'm sure you can see that in the background. I want to cover a couple of watches that really put Gruen on the map. Now, it was in 1925 that Gruen came out with its first quadron movement, the Calibre 117. Now, this was a kind of breakthrough movement in the fact that it was rectangular uh, versus the round shape or the tank shape that had been done so much in the past. So Gruen really kind of led the way into this aesthetic um, from about 1925 to 1935, Gruen came out with some truly remarkable and all lengthy designed watch cases. Now, for Gruen fans, of course, the Curvix is a watershed in the company's history from around 1935, when Gruen rolled out its first Curvex patented movement, the Calibre 311. This became an instant sales success and was actually copied by virtually every other watch manufacturer of the time. Now, it was never replicated the way Gruen did it, but a lot of people tried to get in on the rectangular case curved action. Another watch you'll hear brought up in reference to Gruen is the Duodial Doctor's Watch, which is often called the Techni Quadrant. The name Duodial came into being because the predominantly uh, very, very large small second display was as much space on the watch as the hour and minutes display, making the watch look like it almost had two dials. Now, the first Techni Quadrants were the Calibre 877, which was produced in 1928 by Aiglaire and then sold to Gruen. These were also, however, sold to Rolex in use of their company's Prince models. So this makes them very, very popular with collectors. For those of you who didn't know, Aiglaire made the vast majority of Rolex watch movements uh, throughout most of the company's history. I believe it was bought out by Rolex in 2004, I want to say, where Aiglaire and Rolex became one company and Rolex finally started to manufacture movements in-house because they owned Aiglaire. So there is more to the history of Gruen than this, and I'll cover a little bit more on some of its other notable watches after we've gone through the plating. So the watch there has been in Plater's Pickle, which is just a dilute hydrochloric acid. I think you call it mutic acid in the US. I'm not sure. Not that difficult to come by anyway. So I'm going to use dilute copper sulfate here and I'm going to copper plate the watch before I nickel plate it. Now I do this for a couple of reasons. Copper is a very, very good base for the nickel to stick to, but I'm going to do a thin copper strike layer. This just lets me see any plating there'll be in the error and it's easy to strip off if I need to go back and correct anything. So this step is entirely unnecessary and there's a copper anode, a pure bar of, I think this is 99.5% pure copper. Um, as reference samples of copper tend to get expensive, you don't need to go all out. Now I tend to plate at around 300 milliamps. This is just a homemade variable power supply. You can pick up pre-made ones. Uh, you don't need much current, so you don't need a very expensive thing. As you can see, this is going to come out. It's going to be shiny copper. You want your stuff to come out shiny. If it's coming out dull and matte, it might indicate a problem. It's not normally that much of a problem. You can polish it out, but I look for, I want to pull it out, the plate and solution. I want it to be almost perfect. So there it is in copper. I'm going to bung it back in the dilute hydrochloric acid. Uh, the reason for this is copper is non-reactive with hydrochloric acid. So 
all you're doing here is taking off any fat or oil or maybe some dust that might have settled in. Again, you could skip that step. And the water I'm putting in here now is slightly alkaline just to neutralize what's left of that acid. And then we'll go into the nickel plating solution. Now, the reason I do it at low current, by the way, 300 milliamps, is uh, just because no large bubbles will form. And that's the reason for this substance here. This is sodium laurel sulfate. can be sold as sodium cocoa sulfate. You can buy it from soap makers, um, you know, homemade makeup shops, suppliers. It's not a controlled substance. It's easy to get your hands on. It's just basically a soap is what it is. It's a surfactant. This step again is skippable, but that sodium laurel sulfate will stop the formation of large bubbles when you're plating. It's used in industrial plating processes. So you can use higher current. I still don't. I still go around 300 milliamps. Uh, so an adjustable power uh, current limit in power supply is very, very handy here. And I'm going to pull this out. And you should see it's been in there for about 15, 20 minutes. The exact duration is not too precise. Plating is a bit more of an art form than a science at the home level. Obviously, industrial plating, it's all worked out exactly what you need to do. But I tend to leave mine for about 20 minutes. Now, you can see through the liquid, we don't have the formation of any large bubbles. And when I pull it out, it's extremely shiny, which is pretty much what I want to see. But I'm actually going to jump back in to the reassembly now i'm going to show you that at the end sorry to leave you there but it's all going to come together at the end and you're going to see exactly how we did with that now one thing to note is when i was looking at this hairspring it came out the cleaner it's stuck together there's a couple of reasons for that it could be off center it could have some grease and oil left on it or it could actually be magnetism magnetism plays murder with hairsprings so i'm going to take out the cap jaw here are from the ink block setting and then i'm going to bung this back in some bergeon bead it to make sure it's a hundred percent clean and also to clean the pivots because this thing was left in the watch to protect it during the ultrasonic cleaning so the jewels were still covering the pivots so it's good practice to make sure those pivots are clean if that doesn't unstick the hairspring, well, to be fair, even if that does unstick the hairspring, I'm going to put the whole assembly back on the main plate and walk it over to my demagnetizer and demagnetize it just to be on the safe side. So here's that extra cleaning step, which will allow me to clean those pivots, which were obscured by the jewels when it went into the ultrasonic cleaner. Now, this is Bergeon B-Dip. There are cheaper things to use. And I'm just agitating the water. Uh, or the B dip in this case with a blower. I also hold that up to to get in there, really clean that spring. So that's out of the cleaning solution. I'm going to throw this thing on a balance tack and put the jaw back in it, and then I'm going to demagnetize it. So here I'm just blowing it again with a dryer to evaporate what's left of that B dip. It evaporates pretty quick. It's designed to do exactly this. It's designed to clean jewels and things. It doesn't melt shellac. Do not throw this into isopropyl alcohol. What you'll do is you'll melt the shellac on your impulse jewel at the bottom of the balance wheel there. And then there really will be tears before bedtime. So what you're looking for here is about 50% of the surface of the center of the jewel covered with oil you don't want it everywhere but neither do you want too little this can be quite tricky and i'll show you this later under a microscope so it'll give you a better view of what's going on so we bring the jewel and housing together and then we can put this back in the shock setting on top of the balance cock and put the spring back down this will actually protect the watch from any knocks to those pivots excellent excellent invention far easier than the other way to do it and if you want to see the other way that it's done with kind of a fixed jewel on top of the balance cock see pretty much any of my other videos pain in the backside these springs and shock settings especially the captive ones like this one are so much easier to deal with now i'm going to go ahead and put this back on the plate and demagnetize it i just use a cheap chinese demagnetizer and then you can see our hairspring looking perfect so that's exactly what i'm looking to see when that goes back in now i'm going to use a mobius 8200 natural grease to oil up this spring and as i mentioned mentioned previously this is most certainly the wrong spring I'm using it for now as this watch will as I mentioned stay in my private collection so I can just swap this out for the correct spring at any time and this should be enough to get us up and running anyhow so I'm just going to move the end of the spring in manually if you keep winding what can happen or at least what happens to me is the spring will snap into the winder and snap the hook right off the end of the spring 
The other issue we're going to run into with this spring is my winders only wind in one direction and this spring should be wound in the opposite direction of what my winders wind in. So if you've watched my videos before you've probably seen me use a 3D printed tool to decant the spring from the winder into and then flip the tool upside down and push it into the barrel. There's another way that a subscriber actually suggested which is to decant the spring from this winder into a slightly bigger winder like this and then decant the spring. This will mean that you can use your winders to wind a left-handed spring to the right or a right-handed winder to wind it to the left. If that sounds confusing, it is a little bit, but we have our spring the right way up now, so it's all good. You have to pay attention to which way round or which direction your spring is going in, otherwise you're not going to be able to wind your watch. Now, this is my most hated part of watchmaking, I think, getting the barrel arbor back in. I've made this look very easy. And again, a few of you had suggestions for tools to do this. I'm um, checking that out, but for right now, I am still doing it the way I've always done it, which is to get it at an angle and push it in. Now, I'm going to whack the barrel lid on with even pressure with the aid of this 3D printed tool. You don't actually need to 3D print one of these. They're available on AliExpress. Just look for barrel lid closer for about five quid. They're just a plastic thing with an indent in the bottom, basically. It just allows the barrel lid to get on with even pressure. Before we get this thing back together, hopefully in some semblance to the right order with all the bits where they should go so we can get a tick and tock out of it with bit of luck, fingers crossed. I want to show you my new toy. This is a Link Micro microscope. This thing has been invaluable. Now Link Micro did send this to me. They didn't pay me to do a review. I don't really review and I'm not really going to review this. I just want to give you my thoughts on it. So we're looking at the main plate now. I can check that my jewels are clean. I love this thing. Regular viewers to the channel will know I've been looking for one of these or something similar to it for quite some time and this one suits watchmaking really well in my opinion. There's enough height between the lens and the watch movement so you can work on what you need to work on. You can get your head under there with a loop on it. Also came with three separate lenses for extreme levels of magnification and I have already used this thing to find quite a number of errors that I would have otherwise missed. It's really good for quick fast inspection. Now you can use it to inspect the pivots which I'll show you in a minute, you also the gears, anything you want really. I've been very very happy with this it's got a 4k camera on board a big screen it's easy to use and as i say it's allowed me to spot things i otherwise would have missed now do you need one of these if you're just starting off in your journey into watchmaking definitely not should you stick one on the nice to have list i think so got a birthday coming up christmas whatever got a bit of spare dosh in your wallet uh give this one a look i'll link it down below it's not an affiliate link for me I don't make anything of it. I just actually do really like it. So you see there, I spotted a small gold hair on that gold wheel. Um, very, very inconvenient. But this allows me to just quickly inspect every part. I'm going to inspect the pivots. I'm not going to make you watch all the part inspection. I think it'd be a little dull. But here you can see the pivot on our intermediate wheel has a tiny micro hair on it that just would have been impossible to spot with a loop. What I also like is it allows me to see those errors in the plating. What is an error? What can be cleaned off and what cannot? Because often, especially under the lighting conditions I use with the cameras I use and the close ups, things that look like maybe dirt or debris actually aren't. And once again, you can see perfectly clean jewels, no cracking, no nothing. Quick inspection of the teeth here on our barrel. And you can see those errors on the barrel. Well, not errors, more wear and tear on that plating. Now, that's going to happen over time with age. This thing is 70 years old. So when you are looking at the video here with a main plate on it, what might look like dust is simply we are so close we're actually beginning to see errors and the microscope allows me to show that so i very very much enjoyed it as i say link will be below if you want to go check it out it's on the nice to have list for me for sure and hopefully it adds something to these videos gives you a better look at what's going on and gives me four cameras to edit instead of three but needs must so the center wheel goes in and the barrel complete goes in after the 
little oil has been put down there on the main plate. Now somebody asked me what pithwood was used for. This is pithwood and I use it for cleaning pivots, for cleaning oilers, that kind of thing. It's fantastic stuff. It's not expensive. I'll link the Cousins link somewhere and the American Shop one, which name I forget because I never use it, but I'll link it in. So I also want to go ahead and thank a bunch of you who recommended to me component probes instead of pegwood for pushing bridges down so I don't leave any kind of dust from the pegwood behind. I've gone ahead and ordered some of those so you should see them in the next video. So thank you for that. I very much appreciate everyone that comments especially to help me which is 90% of you. Um, I really do appreciate it. So center wheel bridge getting screwed down. I'm going to clean the pivots in the pithwood as I mentioned. It's excellent for this. You can also just plunge things like your tweezers and screwdrivers directly into it. It is kind of like balsa wood if you've ever dealt with that. Intermediate wheel goes in. A little bit of fiddling around to make sure that the pivot goes through the jewel on the bottom. Center second wheel. This will have a very long pivot on it because the center second will actually be connected directly to it through the other side of the watch. Set lever screw, the number of times I've left that out before I put the barrel bridge on. And you see there in the background, this tiny little hair floated down from the middle of the ethos just to ruin my day. So what I have a tendency to do is constantly blow air across the surface of my movement as I'm working because I don't have a clean room. I'm not at an Intel facility here. And then this happens. So this is the trainer wheels bridge. You've got to get three very, very small pivots through those jewels in the top. Normally I edit this so it's not quite so tedious. And normally it takes a couple of minutes. But there, bang, it just fell on. It's never happened to me before. Um, but yeah, it just dropped right on. All the pivots went through the jewels, as you can see here on the microscope. Uh, easiest train of wheels bridge I've ever fit. So I don't know if it's the design of this Gruen 510 or I just got really lucky, but for whatever reason, that was definitely the easiest train bridge I've ever fitted. And you can see here our wheels spin very freely, almost frictionless is what you want them. So we'll get these bridges screwed down. I'm going to use a pegwood to hold it down so it doesn't pop out of the pivots because that can happen and then you can end up over tightening and crushing your pivots. I know because I've done it. Uh, I assume most people have at least once. So I use Pegwood now. As I mentioned, um, a, a bunch of you in the comments told me to go and get some component probes. So I'm going to definitely do that. And I want to take a minute to thank everybody that comments. Everybody has been super helpful. I've been doing this for just about a year now and on YouTube that is, and everyone's been super helpful. I was genuinely surprised the watch community is fantastic. Uh, I've gone to other people's videos and the comments are like an absolute horror show, uh, but mine's always extremely nice. So I wanna thank you all for that, it's much appreciated. So I'm rebuilding the top of the barrel bridge here. So the crown wheel is gonna go on, then the click, then the ratchet wheel. Uh, a little bit of oiling is going on here just for that. I put a little bit of oil on this one where I saw some wearing on the plate. Normally I wouldn't put some there, but where there's wearing on the plate, I tend to err on the side of caution and that oil can't escape from under there and contaminate anything else. So I felt quite safe to do so. Now, this is a crown wheel with the two small screws instead of the reverse threaded screw in the middle. I prefer this design. And if I hadn't mentioned everything about the screw M510 is nice. I, it, it's sound. It's right up there with pretty much any other 1950s movement I've worked on. Um, now, obviously, this is just a manual wind. It's not an automatic, so it's a fairly simple watch. But it is simple in a way that's elegant too. It's easy to take apart. It's easy to put back together. I still haven't seen anything that would explain why it wasn't running. Um, it could have just been old oil jamming it up. It was dirty. There was a lot of hair in it. So it could just be a jammed up set of wheels. I'm not sure at this point. I've inspected everything under the new microscope. And as far as I can see, there were no snapped off teeth. There were no bent pivots. There was no serious signs of damage, at least. But I kind of have a bit of a sense of foreboding about why this is not working. And we'll catch up with that in a minute. Now, here's the embarrassing moment where I have forgotten to put a 
bridge screw in before I screwed on the crown wheel there. No harm done in this case. If it had been the trainer wheels bridge, it could have been bad, but it wasn't. So I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying it could have been worse. So I'm going to take a look at the ratchet wheel under the microscope now just to check for any damage. Now you can see, again, we've got some wear on the plating that's not going to look good on camera. But it can't be cleaned off. You would have to completely sand down the wheel and replate the whole thing to get rid of it. And it is just cosmetic. Now check for a bit of end shake on the barrel. Not too much, not too little. And then we can move the click aside and get the ratchet wheel on. This can be a bit of a pain in the bottom, uh, but it goes on fairly easily in this case. I think it's just a very well designed movement. Everything's sort of gone back together and apart very easily. Impressed so far. Now as we're coming to finish out this side of the watch I'd like to round out my very brief history of Gruen and other Gruen watches you might want to be on the lookout for. So there's a Gruen driver's watch which I'll flash a picture up here which is very interesting and very admired among collectors and in 1950 Gruen introduced its automatic watches its Auto Wind series. Gruen opened a plant in Norwood, Ohio and produced 17 and 21 dual movements for men and ladies watches. Now those from the 1950s are the only true 100% American Gruens. And their presence in the marketplace, they didn't last long. In 1958, Gruen moved to New York and all of its factories in Cincinnati were closed. So generally considered among collectors that 1958 was the end of collectible Gruens. So I'm just finishing up polishing my cap jewel here. You want a mirror polish on that. And to do that, I use just a bit of leather on a stick. No fancy tools necessary for this one. It also got a dip in Bergeon B dip and it's going to get a drop of oil on it. Now, I think I mentioned before that the oil should cover about 50% of the center of the jewel. And you're going to want to go ahead and I'm going to drop that back in the main plate, trying not to drop it on something else first or your oil will become contaminated and smeared and you'll have to do the whole process over again have done that a number of times so this is basically the top of the watch built or the actual back side of the watch the dial side being on the other side and here is the dial side so we can now start to put together the keyless and motion works now i'm going to put a drop of oil on there before i put the cannon pinion on the reason the cannon pinion goes on first is if you get the minute wheel in you can't then put the cannon pinion on because there's a chance you'll shear the teeth off the minute wheel so a little bit of oil here for the minute wheel and the minute wheel goes on now the Motion works in this and the keyless works are pretty standard. Um, no surprises. There is your intermediate winding wheel. This wheel isn't indexed, if you'll remember, so it does not have a uh, taper to it, so it can just go back on any way you want it to. Now, a little bit of grease here for the winding pinion, and then the sliding pinion will go in. A little bit of grease for the back of the movement, just to make sure that doesn't wear up against the main plate. And again, as I mentioned, very well designed movement, this one. So the Breguet teeth getting oiled on both the winding and sliding pinion. Breguet teeth created, of course, by Breguet. They're just a high torque gear. Uh, allows a lot of power to be transferred without the you know, risk of snapping delicate teeth off. So you can see how that sliding pinion slides backwards and forwards to interface between the intermediate winding works, uh, the intermediate winding gear and the winding pinion. Having a bit of a senior moment there, right? A little bit of oil for where our yoke is gonna go and the yoke will interface there with the sliding pinion, moving it backwards and forwards, changing the watch from setting mode to winding mode. Kind of simple. Um, well, simple now you know how to do it, I guess. I don't think it was too simple for the people that created it. So our setting lever will go in. Now this will have to be screwed in from the other side, but you can see that interfaces with the yoke. And that will need a bit of oil where you have that metal on metal contact because you don't really want uh, metal on metal grinding on each other. Now the yoke spring goes in. I used to have huge issues with this. I used to use a piece of plastic to make sure it didn't jump away. I'd still recommend that to people if you want to see that in my older videos, please do. Now I'm a little more confident. I still do send parts to join the Swiss space program. Don't get me wrong, but it happens 
less frequently. So the cover plate for the keyless works is going on. This contains the setting jumper, which will need to be pushed into place. If you leave it there and then screw the whole thing down, you can end up bending it. And again, tears before bedtime. This keyless works is very similar to a lot of Swiss designs from the same time period. They're all pretty much of a muchness. If you can put one together and take it apart, you can pretty much put them all together and take them apart. So the cover plate for the minute wheel, without this, your minute wheel would simply fall, over, fall off when you turned your watch upside down, which would be a bad thing. Now we have a cap jewel left on this side of the watch as well as an ink block setting, but the cap jewel is the same as the one on the trainer wheels bridge that I did, and the ink block setting is the one on the balance cock are exactly the same, so I'm not going to make you sit through that again. Right, I'm going to make a strap for this watch. I have some excellent vintage leather that would suit it just fine. It looks absolutely gorgeous. And what I've decided to do is use the cheapest tolls known to man. So my English part in knife, which I like very much, is out. And this $1 hardware store knife is in. Now, there's a reason for this. And it's people often ask me what tools to buy for watchmaking, basic watch repair and servicing. And I always recommend the expensive stuff. I kind of have to, you need the expensive stuff to do the work, the cheap cheaper stuff often doesn't work it makes your life so much more difficult so I figured I've been working with leather for a long time I have very nice leather working tools uh, this one here is eight dollars um, this is not a nice tool it is blunt the first thing I would recommend you buy if you buy one of those cheap toolkits on Amazon for leather work which all this stuff came out of is buy a set of stones to sharpen them because they are blunt this is painful but anyway, I thought it would be nice to just do a part of the video with $20 worth of tools. So strap making is actually how I got involved in watchmaking. The actual watchmaking part looked way too complicated for me. Um, it seemed to take up way too much time. The tools were very expensive. So years and years ago, I did actually buy one of those $20 leatherworking kits from Amazon and it just had at it with straps. It let me do something with watches that wasn't quite the commitment that actual watchmaking would be. I hate this knife, by the way. This $8 knife is, yeah, it might be fine if I could sharpen it, but I've decided to do this with just basically what came in the kit. Now, I also, you'll see me clamp everything down in this, and it's because I use a white uh, leather glue. It looks a bit like PVA glue. It is not my leather guy. He makes it himself. I don't know what's in it. It smells strongly of ammonia. And all the um, ingredients are non-existent because it's made by some old dude in a leather working shop. It works fantastic. I, for this video, went out and bought uh, from just the big box hardware store, leather glue. It's it's awful. I hate it. It's goopy. It gets bits everywhere. But in the spirit of this particular endeavor, we are going to use like the cheapest of the cheap for everything and see if we can create a strap that would cost a considerable amount of money if you were to go and buy a handmade strap on vegetable tanned vintage leather like this. Now, part of the reason I'm using these clips is because the glue is terrible so normally i wouldn't bother with this i wouldn't have to but with this glue these bulldog clips have been a lifesaver now i 3d print my own templates you can cut around a piece of paper if you want uh, i 3d print mine because you know have printer will print and i'm just using a cheap owl needle will do but this one did actually come in the kit uh or this one actually might be mine i can't remember but it's just a needle on a stick i can't remember what i used in the video and we're cutting through this no problem at all now i padded this strap as well there's something about having a padded sort of vintage leather watch strap i really like it just really screams american to me for some reason i no idea um this is an 18 millimeter so there you go don't mean to brag or anything but um yeah 18 millimeter nailed it right to cut the round at the bottom i've seen people try and cut around this in one go you know when you're cutting around the template that's probably going to be problematic for you especially if you're dealing with you know a stiffer leather so this is the way I do it I normally do this with a different knife so I'm a little hesitant here but again you know $20 worth of tools is doing the job just fine you can make some spectacular stuff with this and I'm just really happy that for once I don't have to recommend some ridiculously priced Bergeon tools that are going to kill your wallet 
I just wanted to do a video where, or at least a part of the video, where if you want to get started, but you don't want to spend a lot of money, you don't know if it's for you, get one of them cheap $20 leather making kits from Amazon. You know, it comes with a knife and, and a, a few bits, some hole punches and stuff, and that's going to be more than enough. Now I'm getting the other half of the strap together here. This is the more complicated bit. I think, I hope I left enough in the video. So if you want to follow along with this and make a strap like this, you can do. This is one of the easier ways of making a strap, by the way. This will give you a very elegant, very nice strap uh, without so much of a pain in the backside. There are more complicated ways of doing it for various different results. So I make straps occasionally on commission for fellow collectors. And normally I'll make them for deployant class because straps can be kind of hard to find for like Amiga deployants or Cartier deployants. So I'll make straps that fit these particular clasps. Um, but, you know, a basic bog standard strap that goes on a buckle is such a wonderful thing to make. I love making them. I love putting them on my own watches. Sort of vegetable tanned leather. It can be really nice to work with. Uh, chromium tanned I would avoid just because you're not making like a huge thing here. So you can actually spend, in my opinion, a little bit more money on a little bit more quality material because you're not using, you know, a massive amount of it. Or at least that's my philosophy on it anyway. I'd rather go high quality for something small like a strap. I mean, I'm not making a suitcase here. The other half of this strap is coming together nicely. I'm just getting the strap keeper in and then I can fold that over make sure that it isn't loose i hate loose strap keepers um it's just one of my pet peeves you know you buy a new watch band it looks kind of cool and then after a week or so your strap keeps flapping about in the breeze can't stand it so i make sure that mine are a perfect fit just just one of those little annoyances you know i'm going to get it glued back together because again of the glue the clamps come out and uh, then the clamps are actually quite useful even with good glue in certain circumstances if you really want to hold the edge down i'm going to use again this came in the kit but i think you could buy this individually i think i saw this for ten dollars it comes with this kind of marking piece and it comes with an edge beveler as well so it actually works fine it's great value for money and the more expensive one is simply nicer to use. It doesn't necessarily do a better job. There are other ways of marking leather that can be a little more accurate than this. But for a nice rugged looking strap like this, this works just fine. So after I've made these lines for the stitching, I'm going to come in and make sure that that strap keeper is once again nice and tight. And then I'm just going to poke holes in this thing. Now, these punches aren't the best. I think they've been sitting in my drawer for ages. So you need to give them a bit of welly. But... They work just fine, like there's nothing wrong with them. So I'm going to hand over the strap now to my missus, who's going to do the sewing. Now, I'm not trying to inadvertently make the world's most sexist video. I'm actually cooking the dinner in the background as she's doing the sewing. So it's just simply a division of labor household. Does anybody remember New Yankee Workshop? Norm Abrams. I used to watch it when I was a younger man. It was kind of the only woodworking content you could get in England. Definitely no YouTube back then. Dinosaurs roaming the earth, all of that stuff. I love that guy. I remember he made a huge chest of drawers. I think it was a chest of drawers that he wanted a fabric lining for. And he just said on that, now obviously men don't sew, so I'm going to hand this to the missus. And even as a younger man, I remember thinking, Norm, mate, I don't think you can say that anymore. So here we are. I've done the same thing as Stormy Norman there. Uh, but I am, as I said, in the background cooking the dinner. So nobody write to me. Right. Now I'm going to finish this off. I am going to just sand the edges down. You can burnish them also. Um, there was a little burnisher in the kit. Um, but even if you don't buy the kit, burnishers are just bits of wood. There was no edge roller in the kit. This is easier with an edge roller, but I'm just using a big needle because like it's easy enough it just takes a little bit longer but realistically how many straps are you making now i would recommend that you go out and buy some tokenol it's great for burnishing edges like this it's also good for just you know uh, protecting leather in general although it is designed as a burnishing gum you can use it on the surface of leather instead of wax or another product now i'm going to cheat a bit here with this punch because i couldn't find the one that came in the kit so this is one of mine um 
I don't think there's any difference between a more expensive one like this and a cheaper one, except the cheaper one will go blunt quicker. I'm sure everyone's had a cheaper knife. They just go blunt quicker. Uh, and these things are a pain to sharpen. So I would buy the more expensive one, but the cheap one will do you, you know, probably more straps than you'll use in a lifetime unless you're actually selling straps. So there we go, the hole's in. I only put three in because this is a strap for me. So there is no need for more than three holes. The one in the center will be the main one and then I'll have adjustment either side. Now that strap you can see there on the right is the $60 Hirsch strap. The sewing is not straight. I just noticed that I had that strap for years uh, on something or other. It just about falling apart now. So it's not in its best of condition. Um, but yeah, I kind of saw that on the video and went, hmm, yeah, not happy about that for the price paid. But anyway, uh, yeah, I'm going to just put some tokenol on this. Just uh, any kind of leather cream would do. So I just happen to have the tokenol on the table. So I'm using something a bit more expensive, but really not going to make that much of a difference. Now, I think this strap turned out to look absolutely fantastic. It is perfect for this watch because this watch is a little dressy and this strap will turn it into something that is more of a day-to-day -day wear more of a more utilitarian in my opinion whereas if i stuck it on a piece of black crocodile it would definitely be a dress watch now it's more of a day-to-day thing so i hope you all enjoyed this strap making portion of me just talking about stuff and strap making um if you did do let me know because i'll do it in the next video with something a little more exotic snake skin crocodile or something like that if that's something you're interested in seeing let me know so back to the actual watchmaking away from the leather work and we're going to fit the pallet fork and pallet bridge now, all that's left to do here really is drop in the balance complete and see if this thing ticks. Now, this is the best bit of watchmaking, in my opinion. When you put that balance back in and see the watch tick, you know you've done a half decent job at least that something is happening. Now, I'm going to test the pallet fork is just flicking backwards and forwards nicely, which it is. And then I'm going to put the balance back in and see if we get a tick. Now, the pallet fork is currently in the wrong position for this. Didn't notice. So I'm going to take that out and reseat it just to make sure that it went in. But no tick so far now that's a little bit of a disappointment pallet fork in the right position and this happens this is a very bad sign so that impulse jewel is probably in the wrong place so i've got my uh, balance complete here on a balance tack and i'm going to turn that tiny 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 collet around a bit and refit it into the watch now hopefully this will get us closer to a tick this is a very very delicate adjustment to make the watch is very much out of beat at this point so the only thing to do with this style of balance that doesn't have a mobile hair stud is to adjust that collet so we'll get it back in and see if this ticks. It does not, it does not auto start. So I'm gonna give it a blast of air and see if that gets it to tick. It does tick with a burst of air. So we're a little bit more in beat than we were. Now here is the watch on a time grapher. And here is my time grapher. We've got a beat error of 6.5 milliseconds. That's too many. Because the watch does not auto start, you would have to wind it every time and then shake it if you wanted to start it. Obviously, that's unacceptable. So we go back to adjusting that collet a tiny bit at a time until we come to that point where our B error is below one millisecond. So I am several adjustments in at this point. I'm not going to make you sit and watch it all, but I put the balance in here. No auto start, but I can get that burst of air again. So we're back to the time graph to have a look. I've adjusted it, I think, for the fifth time now we should be getting very close at this point to a low B error and I put it in and you can see it immediately auto starts as soon as that balance drops in so that's a very good sign so back again to the time grapher and you can see we get a B error of 0, 0.0 milliseconds now we're a little bit out on the time but that can be easily adjusted what we're interested in right now is that B error. And that is fantastic. I honestly didn't expect to get it to 0, 0.0. I would have been happy with anything under a millisecond. And even if you're over a millisecond, people get very caught up on B error. But in my opinion, even if you have a higher than one millisecond B error, if your watch doesn't overbank, and it auto starts and it keeps good time, I wouldn't risk adjusting the hairspring collet 
breaking it, snapping it. I've seen it happen uh, just to get that B error to a lower number. On modern balances, it's easier to adjust, but on vintage ones, well, I'll have to leave that to you. So oiled all the jewels there under the microscope. Fantastic for that. And now we go on to the hand looming portion. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to make these hands orange. I'm using a little bit of orange to give me a nice kind of... Uh, off-white color bright white on a vintage watch often looks mm, kind of weird and i'm not that big of a fan of fotina i'm just going to mix this up i'm looking for the consistency of sort of a runny-ish toothpaste so there's not enough binder in here at the moment so i'm going to add a little more and keep mixing until i get the consistency just about right so I've thrown the hands on a balance tack, which you'll see in a second, and then I'm just going to smear this on. It really is quite simple to do. Uh, it can be a pain. You can end up redoing it as it if it wicks through to the front, onto the front of the hands, because obviously you're going to do this on the back if you've never done it before. Don't try and get it perfectly on the front of the hand. Yeah, you'll just be there for a month of Sundays and it will never look right loom the back and then flip the hands over after about four hours depending on the loom you're using and how thick your binder is and various other things but just wait for it to dry flip them over and uh, hopefully you'll be good um, on the last video i did there's an example of what these look like if they're not good because i messed it up but on this one i think or i seem to remember i filmed this a while ago that these were fine on first blush so i love that color by the way that mixture of orange loom that's a bergeon orange loom and a cheaper anchor white loom does the job really nicely so let's get this all together now here's the dial under a microscope now you can see a little bit of schmutz by the 12 that can be cleaned off. There you go, cleaned off, easy peasy. And again, microscope coming in kind of clutch for this because it allows me to see that a lot of these black spots are actually through the surface of the dial. They are not something that can be cleaned off. So scrubbing at some of these spots would just leave me in a bigger mess than I started in. So I've got it as clean as I can. I just used a microfiber, a tiny cotton bud thing, and wiped off the dirt, and then a piece of Rodico to pick off any dust. Now the hands are, have to be quite precise on this because this watch actually has precision written on the front. Not, you know, it's a Gruen precision. It's it's not a Gruen close enough. So I really am going to try and put some time into getting the hands on straight. Now, hands can be a pain. I forget which famous watchmaker said I love watchmaking apart from the hands, but I completely agree. It can be a ginormous pain not to get the hands to bump into each other. So after I've got my hands on, I'd like to do a full rotation just to make sure they don't bump into each other, that the second hand doesn't bump into them or anything. Now the hands on this turned out to be a slightly bit misadjusted. I actually came back and adjusted the hour hand just a smidgen. Again, grew in precision, not grew in close enough. Now we'll get this thing back into its case, which is looking substantially better than the absolute trash nugget we started with. Now I'm going to use a 3D printed spacer here along with a movement ring. I'm only using this temporarily. I have got a proper one on order, but this will just stop it wobbling around all over the place temporarily so I can wear it out for a few days and test it out. But this thing is running like clockwork, like a Swiss watch. It's absolutely fantastic. At this point, I've had it on wrist for two weeks. It keeps time wonderfully now let's bring it all home stick it all together and see what we actually made and what it looks like now no spoiler from me i think this watch looks fantastic excellent taste from sean connery on this one i can genuinely see why he wore it and why it survived through so many bond movies on his wrist this thing is fantastic looks great in my opinion you'll have to tell me in the comments what you think tell me what you think of the strap making i'd like to know if i should include more of that it's been very nice talking to you all this was a monstrous project for me i think it turned out really really well i couldn't be more happy i'm glad you stayed with me this far if you did indeed stay with me this far drop a like and subscribe on the video if you're in the mood a lot of work went into this one Thank you all again, and hopefully I will see you in the next one where we will probably be putting together a very, very unique Seiko.